Hello, everyone. I am um, Alex Burtek, uh, product manager at Keysight. Um, and Ankun going to help me to present to this section as well, uh, uh, second half of it. Uh, so we are presenting a new product today, uh, AI Data Center Task Platform. What this product does, it allows you to emulate AI workloads uh, so that you can benchmark your AI network infrastructure. And I circled uh, with a red square which part of the AI cluster is the network infrastructure. And so with the goal of co-tuning, um, uh, components of the AI cluster to get to the best performance. So why do you need this? Uh, some time ago, I stumbled upon a uh, GitHub repository from uh, OpenAI co-founder, Andrei Karpatny. Um, uh, the repository is called uh, NanoGPT. It's an approximation of GPT-2 level of, of training. And uh, over there, she has a sentence that says uh, the following. Um, if you're going to run this on a multi-node distributed cluster, you better benchmark your network. And in particular, if you don't have InfiniBand, your network, uh, your training is going to work, but most likely will crawl. So we're going to talk about Ethernet. We're not going to talk about InfiniBand. That's where everyone is going. And uh, what he wrote was probably valid two years ago. Uh, I think that should be changed. Um, the industry has matured. The, when I mean industry, I mean Ethernet networking industry to be able to at least, uh, you know, go out of the crawl age and walk. And uh, some people, uh, even if they put enough, if they put enough effort they can even make their training job run. Um, for example, um, Meta recently open sourced their Llama 3 model for 405 billion parameters, huge model. They trained it on Ethernet fabric over Rocky protocol, uh, and uh, it took them around six weeks to finish the training. Um, so, and as part of the of releasing the model, they also published a few papers. And one of the papers says that um, the co-tuning of the software stack on the cluster, on the servers, is critical to get to the performance, uh, co-tuning it with the network, because the developers of that stack, they typically uh, test it in the environment that is radically different from what any particular AI operator will really have in production. So that uh, really gets to very suboptimal performance if you don't perform that, this core tuning. And that's what the heart of the, the platform that we are providing to, to customers. Sonic core, is it a emulation of a training workload training. or inferencing? That's correct. Training workload. Training. Yes. Training is much more um, network resource intensive. intensive or network intensive and requires much more GP. Okay. Uh, so Drill a little bit to this, to this uh, diagram that you saw uh, already. Um, so yes, the orange part, if you take all the tasks during the training, the orange part is when something fails. Uh, it can be a hard failure because let's say an optical transceiver went down, or it can be a soft failure where there was a packet loss and the communication library uh, that moves data between GPUs timed out and typically what happens here, you have to stop and go back to the last checkpoint and restart. Okay. Now the green part, like 55, 56% there, and this is data from that Alibaba published. Okay. Um, the, the circle part is from Alibaba. <clears throat> the 55% and all then the training tasks completed successfully. I tried to uh, expand that for you to say, well, what the GPUs were actually doing during that 55% of the time. Now that expansion, it's not from Alibaba. I took some of the data Meta published as part of their uh, uh, Facebook research uh, GitHub repository. Um, and this is example for training a vision uh, transformer model. Okay? Uh, and you, you, you might notice here that six, more than 60% of the time, GPUs were communicating to each other. They were not computing anything. They were just moving data around. And then now that like 15%, they were computing and communicating in parallel. 
And only, I don't know, another 15%, they were actually doing just purely computation. So if you just take that big picture and you realize in all these multi, you know, dozens of thousands of GPU clusters, most of the time, GPUs are really just moving data around. They don't compute anything. All right, that's, that's a big problem. We need to shrink that time in order to accelerate the training. Um, and, and another aspect of that is as you get bigger and bigger, the component failures accelerate exponentially. I don't know exact numbers, they're confidential, but what I hear is like you would not believe how often they fail. All right, so now let's uh, look a little bit into what happens during those GPUs accelerate or uh, GPU communications because that's what we essentially need to be able to uh, improve in terms of performance. So if you take a look at this, of, the, of one GPU, typically it does a sequence of steps. It reads something from the memory, does computation, then it communicates, and it's a branching uh, flow. And, and when you have multiple GPUs in the cluster, that communication, this communication time, what happens is the proper name for that is collective operation. Right? And collective operation have different uh, types and shapes and amounts of data they move using different algorithms. Uh, this is just a few examples, and I'm using uh, screenshots from, from our application just to illustrate them without going into much details what they are, but the dots are GPUs and the lines between the dots are how the data is being moved. And once you know, what you may notice here is this very well choreographed sequence of steps. Right? It's just that all you need to know. And it just runs at the speed of wire, essentially, in the, in the, uh, in the data center. Can you explain the, uh, just not a networking expert, so maybe this is going to help, but the all reduced ring versus the all to all. I understand all to all is GPUs transferring data to all the GPUs, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. But the others, I don't understand. Uh, so um, when all to all uh, happens, uh, it's just the same data is being distributed between all the GPUs. They all reduce. It, uh, it, it's, uh, it, uh, it performs a mathematical function on, over the data that all the GPUs have. For example, it just sums it up. So if all the GPUs have some numbers, right. what you want to do, you want to have a resulting sum of all that, right? And it's actually a very intensive operation because everyone has to pass to its, own, its neighbor if you do in a ring, and then the neighbor adds it up, and then passes the result to the next one, and that's how you get to the final result, and then you distribute it across everyone else. And you do that so that the model during the training um, gets kind of synchronized in terms of how you, know, how you need to adjust it to predict better. Some of, this, some of the GPUs are sitting in the same server, and yes. some across are transferring data across the network. Do the ones within the same server use the network to transfer data? Um, they, they use internal network. So the East servers IE, have internal so. networks, um, yeah, uh, and then you go out, you go through a normal network. All right? Sorry. Okay. So let's talk a little bit how those GPUs move data over the network uh, when, when the network is Ethernet, all right, and the GPUs are not in the same server when they're on the different servers. We'll, we'll focus on that. Um, so. Um, the method to move the data is called RDMA, and it's a very important property um, of moving blocks of memory from one host to another host without involvement of a CPU uh, with full hardware acceleration. So how that works in practice? You have a special piece of software called Collective Communication Library, and they, have, they come from different like depending on the GPU vendor, you're going to have its own flavor of the communication library. It actually runs on the GPU itself. And then this GPU, when it needs to send data to other GPUs, it will tell to the network card that I have the data over here, take it and send it to the memory block of my peer over there. And then from this moment on, all the work is going to be done by the network card. It's the network card that's going to read the data from the GPU memory, and it's going to use a transport protocol that provides a way to specify the address of the memory of the remote host 
to send it over. And that's how you can get to almost the line rate at, let's say, 400 gigabits per second speed, moving data over uh, from one GPU to another, and CPU doesn't have to do anything. And so that's why you can have multiple GPUs, let's say eight GPUs, in one server, doing all that in parallel, and each GPU has its own network card to move the data. Right? So it's a really uh, stressing out the network to its extreme. Um, and the, uh, when we talk about Ethernet, the, the, there are several transport options. The most common one is Rocky V2 protocol, uh, but there are others that are typically proprietary, uh, some of them becoming more public. And then you probably heard about Ultra Ethernet Consortium. Uh, this group of companies is also working on creating a new uh, Ethernet transport for uh, AI and HPC uh, workloads. So when you talk about NIC, are you talking about the traditional uh, Ethernet NICs, or are you talking more specifically like uh, smart NICs, like DPUs and so on? You, you can call them either smart NICs or DPUs. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, all they need to do is support RDMA protocol. Uh, now, when it comes to the network, all these streams of data, I want to highlight three key properties that they have that really makes it difficult to uh, get a good performance from, uh, from the, uh, you know, how they... <laughs> Uh, being moved across. Uh, so the first thing is that you may notice over here in this all reduced example, um, there are flow dependencies. You have to complete the first transfer to the, to the intermediate GPU before that GPU can continue on. And so what you have from here is that if you have any latencies uh, in the network, they accumulate. And you can may start quite well, but then as you go along, that things get start, you know, getting out of out of hand. Uh, you'll see that actually now up later. The second thing is all these data transfers, they are all the same. They're like same number of packets. Packets have all the same size. They come, you know, at approximately the same periods of times and uh, they use the same protocols. Like for network, it's really hard to, to really load balance them because they all look the same. It's a big problem, uh, and that causes congestion between the leaf layer and the spine layer of the network, where you don't have enough capacity over a single link. You need to spread the load, and how you spread the load is challenging. So I guess the strategy for spine and leaf is, is almost as important as, as you know, RDMA within the box, I guess. Yes, yeah, yeah. definitely, definitely. So people, the vendors, uh, making a lot of advancements in how the load balancing works. And uh, they go away from a static distribution of based on like, you know, source and destination ports and IP addresses into more dynamic when it takes into account which link is currently less loaded than the other link. It has its negative um, uh, consequences that the packets starting to appear at the destination out of order and the network card has to reorder them. And not all network cards support that. Those that they do, they only have a certain amount of capability to put them in proper order before you know, they run out of buffering. So this is all part of the co-tuning. You want to reduce all that variability and you want to operate within the uh, you know, known supported uh, you know, specifications. Yeah, so I read an article where they were saying that uh, RDMA retransmits were a big issue because it was kind of annihilating the uh, low latency. Yeah, that's right. So if you, would, uh, if you send this RDMA message burst, this is the third point, uh, they may be like 30 32 um, <clears throat> packets. And uh, if you lose any of the packets, you're going to go back and retransmit all of them again. So you really just crash into the network too much. Right. And then the yeah. problem you described with um, you know, putting the packets back in order, is that then referred to, or can that be fixed by a, a deeper uh, queue length, maybe? Yes, yes it can. There, there are several techniques how to do it. Um, and uh, you know, people experimenting with all of them. Alex, can you explain the NCAS graph, the different color schemes on Yeah, it? so I'm gonna get, I was going to get to the last one. So those messages, uh, as I said, right, there's like sequences of packets, let's say 32 packets or something, right? So the NIC will transmit that, and then it will 
uh, have some delay because it needs to read the next chunk of data from memory and then it transmits again and again. And so what happens if you're gonna, this is a real capture we took from a switch close to a destination. And um, the different colors they represent are DMA messages that were sent from different sources to that single destination. The same destination? Same destination. And th those sources, they could transmit on that line rate. It was at 100 gig, uh, this is taken at 100 gig. The sources could, tr could transmit at 100 gig, but destination is also 100 gig, so it cannot accommodate all three of them together. It was just three to one uh, uh, situation. And uh, that could be avoided um, if you wouldn't, if all the three sources would not transmit at the same time, if it would just spread it across the time. It just happens very often in the, in these large clusters that some of the sources start transmit simultaneously. They just start getting synchronized for whatever reason. And there are techniques how to avoid that. But again, you have to involve these techniques and you want to make sure they work properly. And because then otherwise you get this in cast and the red line over there it shows how the buffer on the switch that needs to send to the destination NIC, how it's get overloaded, right? How much usage of the buffer happens because of this in cast. All right? Okay. So now we're going to talk about how would you really uh, perform all this uh, performance improvements. And for quite some time, people were using real AI systems to do all these sorts of experiments with performance to get, you know, with co-tuning to get performance uh, uh, better. But uh, as Uncle already mentioned, uh, there are problems with that approach. So first of all, it's very expensive to build those setups just pure for experimentation. And then the software complexity is so high that if you are a network engineer, right, it's really hard for you to manage the whole system stack on the AI training cluster and run the real uh, job or maybe a benchmark, but still across the whole stack um, in order to be able to, uh, to perform all these experiments. So you need something simpler. And then another thing here is when you run it on a real, um, real system, you can get metrics that characterize performance of every element, uh, they're kind of separated from each other. You can get metrics from the, from the collective library, from the network card, from the network, but you understand they're not correlated. They're just counters, right? You don't necessarily can tell if the performance of my AI workload was delayed by, by a network or a network card, right? And what exactly in the network uh, caused this uh, performance degradation. All right, and so customers like large AI uh, operators uh, came to us and asked like, can we essentially help? Because they are very long time partners. They use our equipment to test normal networks, traditional networks. So they asked, well, can we do something here? Uh, we've been first, working um, on a solution that uh, is the first option. It's the first option we came up with, and it, and it is using, what it's doing, it's simulating an AI workload, and it can do, on, it can do it on servers without GPUs, right? Because we can talk to those network cards, and we can ask network cards to move the data, just read it from a system memory, not from a GPU memory, right? As long as we can, orchestrate that in a similar fashion how the real uh, training job does that, we're good, right? Uh, and it saves significantly on the cost. You can imagine the servers without GPUs, I mean, they're like 10 times less expensive. <laughs> um, and we can correlate metrics much better now because we know every transaction when it started, when it finished. Uh, for every flow in the network, we now have this data. But then, yeah, that's where the, the actual collaboration with the AI uh, practitioners started to happen is because they were saying like, this is good, but I need, like for example, I'm developing my own network card. It's a customized network card, it's flaky. It doesn't show me the good performance all the time, but I need to make sure my network performing well. And I'm a network engineer, I'm not a system, I mean, right? So give me a tool that can test the network itself without depending on the performance of the network card, 
And also, my network is going to be 800 gig. There is no 800 gig network cards. That's why they're building their own. <laughs> Um, and then also give me even deeper insights because in this model, some of the insights, some of the metrics, they're kind of in between the network and the network card, right? It's not our direct measurements. And so that's why we came with the second option, now they are side to side, where we also emulate the hardware. We are emulate the network cards using our hardware traffic generator. Okay. So now we can plug directly to the directly to the network, and test the network, uh, <coughs> and provide all these deep uh, deep network insights. Now the both options are available in the uh, in the product uh, that we are presenting, uh, and it really depends on who is the customer. Uh, if you are a network vendor, you would tend to use the hardware option. If you are a network engineer, you would probably use the, the second option as well. But if you think about the whole system, you know what the network cards are, you know, you know your servers, you can use the first one. That, that's also uh, an option. Now, in, in both these situations, like number one, the, the emulated AI workload is a, is a real network in that situation. You're just generating the information from the software requests. Is that, is that what you're doing? And the, and the yeah, second that, one, uh -huh. you actually have a, the box itself that's generating the workloads to, to the real network, is that? In both cases, the network is real. Uh, in okay. the first case, uh, the, the actual traffic is generated by the network cards exactly the same way they would do. With, with your software it, generating. Yeah, we just, yeah, it's our software that tells them to do it. And in second case, we are trying to approximate the network cards as as best as we can, and we're quite good at that, right? So we can say, hey, this is vendor one, network card, behave as such, or vendor B, behave as such. That's where we are going. And earlier you mentioned proprietary protocols. I mean, does your box emulate the proprietary protocols? Right now we are focused on Rocky V2 only. Proprietary protocols, they, are, they have a very limited use. So, uh, you know, we have discussions, but we don't offer that as, as a part of the product at the moment. Yeah, Alex, when you're describing the challenges, <coughs> going, you've been out of the poor networking game for quite a while, but these are things that have come up before. Because it's not, the theory is not new. It, it seems that this is just we're having to solve the same problems as we've done in IP-based networks and other networks before, but now it's happening in GPU-based networks because I assume it's because everything's just been moving so fast that it hasn't had the time to mature the way other networks have, which is where I see, like, this is classic Ixtia stuff. Like, this is it exactly is. what you have always been doing. That's right. So it makes sense that you would be good at this. It's mm -hmm. just that all of this network infrastructure is GPU-centric instead of being end-user. Application, yeah, or yep. user. Because yes, that's correct. It's, part of it is frustrating to me. It was like, okay, great, we're solving the same problems again. Um, but it is, I guess it's useful in that it's a known problem, so we know that we know how to attack it. It's just going through the process of actually attacking that problem. That's correct. So in fact, if you just take a normal network and try to send traffic through it in a perfectly organized way using our equipment that doesn't account for all the inefficiencies that a real system would have, the network will show you you know, perfect performance, there's no problems. But if you're gonna start emulating all the inefficiencies that the actual network cards and the software behind them introduces, because they have to, I mean, they cannot transmit data continuously, packet over the packet, they have to read it from memory, right? They have to make sure it's got received, it received confirmation that I'm, you know, good, nothing was corrupted, etc. right? That's where all these inefficiencies come in and then where you start seeing it really matters how you fine tune all of these components to make sure they can perform as close as possible to, to the maximum throughput that, in theory, network already provides. And the incentive to do that, in other networks, you'd probably let some of that waste go because it's like, ah, okay, we, it's, it could be 10% or 15% more efficient, but it's just not worth the expense of doing it. But with GPUs, with GPUs it's yeah. so expensive, there's yeah. so much CapEx involved. That, yeah. yeah, actually an extra 5% yeah. is a big yeah. deal. Yeah. 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 Okay. And, and in fact, uh, like, w w you know, it used to be that those training jobs were running on like 200 gigs. Now they're running 400 gigs. 
next year they're going to be running at 800 gigs. You throw 1.6T on them, they're going to keep using 98% of that capacity, right? There is no stopping. The, the more the better, because then you can uh, do the computational part, part uh, more frequently, and that's what you want. Well, yeah, this but, is just like a, a yeah. continuing scale problem with networks because yeah. when when networks were used for like uh, you know sending email or, or web browsing, when storage came along, storage all of a sudden put a much higher demand on networks, and and when we get into doing memory switching, it it becomes like the next order of magnitude beyond that, and yes, it it becomes a hard problem. Yeah, well, yeah. That, the. The five percent is now magnified because it's five percent of a much much bigger number, so it should yeah, come up more right. often. Yeah. But I think also what you're talking about, some of this is quite complicated. So it's five percent over there, connect with another five percent over here on a different bit of equipment, and this bit of equipment is also new. And as you know, um, all of the driver issues that you have with the brand new stuff that is flaky and weird and fails in all sorts of strange corner case ways that don't show up very often until you run the card really really hard. And that's going to show up all the time. Yeah, there. and yeah. it's it, it's the ongoing problem that I always bring up of uh, of somehow trying to treat a network like a bus. Yeah, and <laughs> it, it's very default uh, approaching impossible. Mm. The, does your hardware emulate smart NICs? I mean, so smart NIC traffic versus regular NIC traffic is going to look a little different on the network. We just simulate in this particular case. We are emulating the Rocky V2 part of the traffic that those smart NICs, it's actually pretty much all they're going to do for the AI workload because all the rest, talking to storage, uh, talking to management system, PyTorch, and all this kind of stuff, it's going to be using a different network, a different NIC. We don't worry about that network. That problem mostly been solved. But the, the, the dedicated network that is used or Rocky V2 traffic or other types of RDMA traffic, the other protocols. That's what worries people the most. Um, one more thing uh, before we're going to get to the actual uh, solution architecture is uh, how we enable customers to actually uh, perform the benchmarking. We created two prepackaged methodologies. Uh, these are their, you know, we call them applications. The first application is a collective benchmark. What it allows you to do is to say, hey, I want to understand performance of this particular collective operation, right? And I, what I want to measure is essentially how close can I get to the ideal throughput? Because the, you're always limited given the speed of the network, how fast you can move that amount of data. We allow you to essentially measure how close you to the ideal and then drill down into all the, you know, uh, why you couldn't. Um, now, that's good, and uh, people who really know what they're doing, they know what kind of collective their workloads is running, they know how much data they, they need to move, so they can start using that right away. Now, even those people also want to be able to replay what the real workload does when there are multiple collectives multiple groups of GPUs doing parallel collective communications in different moments of time with different amount of uh, 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 data. Uh, but also we have a much uh, higher number of people who really don't have deep expertise to know what the AI workloads are supposed to be doing. They just want to say, this is, I, I'm going to fine tune Llama 3. Can you replay this process? so that I can benchmark my network uh, accordingly, right? And so that's the workload replay app where we really replay what the real workloads. Well, what do you mean by replay? So we, we, we repeat the sequence of the same steps as the GPUs would do, and when they're supposed to be computing, we just delay for that amount of time, and when they're supposed to be communicating, we're doing collective communications, but if they have multiple of them, we're going to run multiple collective communications in parallel. So is this like working off a trace from a... It's from a trace. That's okay. correct. Yes. Uh, because one of the, the issues with working from a trace is that you end up forcing the sequencing 
of that trace onto your workload rather than using the sequencing that would have naturally occurred when you were running that workload. So with AI workloads, the sequence of steps is predetermined. It's, it doesn't really matter uh, if, your work, if you're training well, you know, one way or another, you're still going to repeat the same sequence of steps over and over again. Maybe you're going to stop sooner if the training went well, <laughs> or maybe you're going to continue longer, but the steps are predetermined. And that helps us to just mimic the computational part and say, hey, we're just going to you know, delay for this period of time, and we're only going to really replay the communication part. The communication part, its duration is going to be real. Right? If your network performs better, we're going to com complete faster. So two, right? two questions about mm -hmm. that. One is um, when you're doing the simulation using synthetic data, even though you're, doing, you're replaying a trace, yep. but you're basically saying, I've got synthetic data, it's not real data, it's just I know that the sequence is A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. Yep. Now, you're doing this based on timing, right? It says, I know that the GPUs typically take or microseconds or milliseconds, whatever it is. Now. I actually know what ex how much exactly they took okay. because it's a trace. It's a trace. Yes. Now, do you introduce any variability in that, any random variability in there so that we it's can. not always yes. identical? Yes, we can. Okay. Yes. As far as the collective benchmark is concerned, are you do you have different styles like you know LLM training versus NLP versus recommender? Is that the kind of things that you're trying to emulate there, or is it just one specific benchmark that you're emulating? So the, the, the collective benchmark, um, so its parameters, and specifically, what kind of collective operation is it all reduce or all to all, and how much data that operation will need to move, that is determined by what you are training. Is it LLM or is it um, you know recommendation model? Did you partition the data to perform uh, just parallel batches of training, or is your model so huge that you also have to partition the model across the GPUs and that's but like data so parallelism, not, model parallelism, it those changes, things. yes, exactly. It changes well, the types of collectives, right? And so, so that's why I said you actually need to know what your workload is supposed to be doing to effectively use collective benchmark, right? Or somebody tells you, This is what my workload is doing. Can you benchmark? And that's what happens with vendors because customers will tell you, like, This is what we need. Go ahead and benchmark your system for that. So are you using just a single trace, or is this the trace gets customized to the, the actual um, client's requirements that, that they'll tell you I'm training a large language model, and so you'll use their, their trace? Yeah, yeah, you can customize like how much data you want to move. You're actually going to iterate, like start small, go bigger, 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 and see how performance. And I think great. one of the challenges with using traces is that you've captured a particular sequence of things that happened, and it's dependent on what's un underneath in the infrastructure. So a fault in the infrastructure causes the trace to appear slightly different. Yeah. Do you have sort of the, the dependency through it of, of you know, the sequence has to occur in this, this order rather than we observe that the sequence occurred in this order? Do you understand that difference? Is that, um, what, am I seeing the result or am I actually emulating the cause element? Because usually a trace, I'm seeing the result, I'm not actually emulating the cause. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So definitely, uh, first of all, you need to replay the parts that succeeded. Don't replay the failed ones. And those that succeeded, they, they, their dependencies is what they follow, that what we follow. Uh, it, those dependencies, as I mentioned, they don't really change uh, if uh, the performance was better or worse. The same dependency. And we're gonna we're gonna have our own performance here measured. So our resulting you know sequence of steps is gonna be as you know is gonna be different from what you would observe on the cluster where you took the trace. It's gonna be what you can expect if you change these network settings, for example. Did you improve or did it get worse? We let you compare. Go ahead. Can you share with us? This word emulated, like I know what it means, but why you're using that over 
simulator or virtualized or software defined or one of those other things that we normally do? Yeah. Like what's the nuance you're trying to get yeah. here? Yeah. So emulated uh, means that it's going to be in, in our vocabulary. Yeah. Yes. It means it's going to be real traffic, right? Um, it's going to be real traffic. Like you look at that, it's really hard to distinguish unless you're going to look in the payload because frankly, here nobody cares about the payload as long as it has enough volume in it. Um, yeah, but uh, it's not produced by the real thing. Right, it's not a real workload. So that we pretended to be a real workload. That's where what emulation. So it's the workload that you're saying emulated versus the yeah, platform. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. it's, yeah. The okay. traffic is real. Almost like a replay. Okay. Well, we are forcing the network card or our equipment to do exactly what would happen in the real world use case. Traffic is real. It's what causes it. Oh. to behave this way. It, this is emulated, right? Otherwise, you would need GPUs. And I think what's confusing me is just that word host. Like when I, like what words modifying, sorry to go into a grammar uh -huh. thing. Uh -huh. But I think that- Oh, emulated hosts. Okay, right. got it. So that's why I think of, you know, what's the difference between a VM, a, a machine, a memory or network card, whatever yeah. it is. But you're saying it's the things that host the emulated workload Maybe yeah. and that's so fair. emulated workload is the one part. Emulated host, what it means is there is no real network card in this particular yeah. case. Yeah. We pretend to behave as yeah. a network card, but then you look at the traffic, it, it's real. Right? So that's yeah. why it's emulated. Okay. Simulator has a different connotation yeah. in our vocabulary, is yeah. when there is no real traffic. It's just all mathematical models and calculations. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Right? There is no traffic. But, but, so that's how we make a difference between emulation and simulation. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah. But <clears throat> what, you're, you, what you're describing is more of a, a trace replay than actually emulating the workload. So you're, you're not actually running the workload. You're, you're simply replaying a trace of an existing workload. Yep. And, Networking. For sure. yep. Yeah, yes. And, and emulation typically more often means that you sequence the, the emulation steps in order of what is happening around it. We, we can modify the trace. We can shrink it, uh, but, expand it, so we can play with all that. But, but, also you, part but of the, the trace can't, the trace can't react to the input that it's getting from it. The trace is always going to follow what the trace is doing rather That's than... That's right. Uh, okay. Yes, so, but in this I, case, it's, there, it's a predetermined, when you're doing AI training, it's not like a random workload, like a storage system or a database. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It is, we know for the next 20 hours to 20 months, we're going to go through this exact sequence. I, I, steps, I understand right? so that, but, but... The trace is okay because... But the, the, the way the trace plays is dependent on the way, the, what it gets back from, what it gets back from the network that it's talking to in terms of sequencing and in terms of results. But the sequencing in, in, never changes. Yeah, in the, in the AI workload, so it doesn't depend on the it, payload. It's very important dif yeah, differentiation of AI workloads from, our, from typical applications. Typical applications, they get the result from a storage, independent if you have this data or that data, <laughs> the logic might change. In AI, it doesn't change. It never but changes. Predetermined. Time changes. Timing does change. Time change, yes. 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 Time, timing does change. I mean, you had, you had the, the history of how you came to be, and you know, Mercury Interactive was one of the first load testing acquisitions mm -hmm. made by HP back in the day. But that's at such a higher application level. So when we get into the notion of an agentic AI, or what we would call a useful AI, there would be an application component. But if you can't get this part right, you'll never get the stuff on top right. And so this, is, this really is, this has to be excellence in all the primitives that are being put in That's forth. right. And yep. if you can't do that, yeah, you're on a house of cards. And you're going to crawl, fall, exactly. What, yes. Or you'll probably over, grossly overspend. Because <laughs> right. one of the questions I had is, you, you, you've been going through papers, you've been looking at what people have done, but what was, what was the original uh, thought they had as to why they put their network the way they, gave, you know, that they did? Was it just, literally, that's the, that's the number of ports we have, and this is what's physically possible for us to do right now? Um, and, and when you talk about these cards that don't exist yet, yeah, that's, that's the... That's the look ahead. That's the future. So um, most of the papers are what's in market available right now.
Correct. The things that are not, you know, the things that are on a bench, no one's writing those papers. That's a, that's a competitive advantage that they're not going to talk about. So when you, when you look at this uh, synthetic traffic and, and when it's set up properly, uh, and you, you're, what, what, what do you believe is the best, uh, I mean, you have prepackaged applications on the title of the slide. I know we were staring at that, but what's, what's the ideal way to approach um, these problems today? Um, was you had the solution one, you had solution two, then you have this notion. So what are you seeing um, now that you're announcing this? Do you have enough interest generated from some of your customers to we say, do. we think we're going to go with option three out of these three options, or do you have a feel for that? All of them are necessary. Okay. It's not one versus another. All of them are necessary, different, and there is more to come. Is, we, there, is there a stage like, well, <laughs> this is the right one for right now, and this will be the right one for the next? Okay. Yes, okay. yes, yes. There is more to come. I just cannot talk about that. All right. How many hosts does the box emulate? I'm sorry? How many hosts does the box emulate? OK. So because um, in the real system, when you have a GPU and a NIC, and it's a 400 gig NIC, and it runs at 400 gig, my 400 gig port, you know, it has to emulate a single NIC, essentially. Because that's all the bandwidth that the real NIC uh, going to get, right? It's not like. So essentially, uh, if I have a, uh, a hardware traffic generator that has 16 400 gig port, 16 400 gig, right? Um, it is approximately as two DGX H100 servers because each of them has eight uh, 400 gig NICs and GPUs, right? So it's like one box is like two DGX. And you're able to coordinate across multiple your hardware boxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Not, there... nobody, not, of course, nobody's going to do it like thousands of ports, but the normal scale for people to experiment, because remember, this is all about experiment, right? You're still going to run the real thing later, but the, the, the scale of people are interested is 120, uh, 128, maybe 256, but by 128 seems to be a sweet spot. Hmm. Most of the problems that uh, show up with scale start appear at that scale. So I'm wondering if you if you can emulate and you have let's say you know 15 different profiles. Is there a way to help the NIC configure itself to be more efficient for a particular workload? For example, you know I I don't know if it exists, but potentially you could have profiles for a NIC for a NIC, right? Yes, that's that's for sure. Okay. We do have profiles for the NICs. Right. Um, when we emulate a NIC, that's what we have to have. We have to say, well, behave as this NIC versus that NIC. Um, right now, we expose a lot of knobs for you to find, as, as normal NIC would do. You would just go in its firmware configuration, and you have a bunch of knobs you can tweak. The only thing that they come with defaults, right? And that's what prof profiles that we are building. It's a work in progress, by the way. Uh, those profiles are based on default settings. Then you can change them and save them in differently. Like this is my NIC profile configuration, and, right. and you can apply it. So an end user will have the ob ability then to select the profile that is closest to what they're yeah, doing. Yeah, yes, that's that's where we are going to. Right. Okay. Thank you. So with that, let's talk about the architecture of the uh, product. Ankur, thank you. Hmm? Thank you, Alex. So we'll take a quick uh, look at the architecture of the product, our AI data center test platform and uh, take it from there. So AI data center test platform, as we talked about earlier, runs on our Ares 1 uh, series of traffic generators. They come in two different flavors, uh, 400 gig and 800 gig. On top of that, we have a brand new software stack that we wrote for this. It's The platform itself is driven by APIs that are model-based. We have our first application, the collective benchmark, that runs on top of that. It can be used by an individual interactively or as part of your CI pipeline for automation. Both are possible, right? Everything is API driven. Uh, after you run your trial, which is the term we'll keep using uh, for this collective benchmark, you get a set of results. And we'll deep dive into them in a minute. But those set of results are useful for 
subsequent analysis. And so we use a data store to store them, retrieve them in the future for analysis and so on. Okay. Aries One series of platforms comes in two flavors. There's a 16 port 400 gig flavor and 8 port 800 gig flavor. They can be fanned out to lower speeds. 200 gig, 100 gig, and so on, right? These boxes, which are custom built by us, right, are capable of generating this rocky traffic that goes on these AI networks at line rate from hardware, just like a real NIC, okay? But in addition to what a real NIC does, True to our lineage of being Ixia, we give you full control over what you're generating. We give you full insights and full knobs, right? Timing measurements down to the nanosecond, we can calculate using this. When a flow starts, when it ended, we can calculate down to a precision of nanoseconds. We are capable of emulating the typical networking congestion control mechanisms that are in use today in the FPGA in our hardware itself. So we behave as close to these real NICs as is possible without having a NIC. So earlier we talked about that 16 port. That essentially is equivalent to a server with eight GPUs or two servers with 16 GPUs total, right? Um, these are available right now and our software stack runs on them. So what is the methodology that is used when people are using our platform? We start with what people want to measure and they want to measure how much did this collective take to complete, this job take to complete. You want to understand what is the utilization of my fabric of the network that was used and tail latencies. <coughs> so one of the unique things about AI workloads is the workload does not go to the next step till every GPU has finished the current step, right? I'm simplifying things a little bit here, but you have to wait. If you did not get the last piece of data that you were supposed to get, the other GPUs are waiting at that point for you to get. The laggard is who determines the pace of the entire job. And so we care about not the average latency, we care about the latency of the 99th percentile, 95th percentile, and we want to get that down as much as possible. So you want to measure these things. How do you want to measure it? So going back to what I just said, uh, minute ago, we can benchmark things down to a nanosecond level. We know when we started these flows. We know when they ended. We can measure all the time durations of the intermediate flows. And we will see that in our demo in a minute. So we get all that data and based on the inputs that you provided, what is the collective I want to do? What is the size of the data that I want to move through this network? How many GPUs are participating in this? What is my infrastructure looking like? And finally, how do I map it to the physical infrastructure that we are using for the test? Based on this, based on the solution that we provided, what kind of testing can somebody do? And this is what we're talking about here. You can test about how long my job took to complete. That's the first piece. I can experiment with different topologies, different algorithms, and so on. Those have an impact on my completion time. Remember, our goal here is to optimize and reduce that completion time. So instead of taking six weeks to train Llama 3, I get it down to four, I get it down to two. I want to train my models as fast as I can so that I can deploy them again faster or cheaper. I can do testing around load balancing if I'm really interested in the network aspect of it. 
I can test is my network load balancing the data efficiently. Is the ECMP hash that I'm using working well? Or do I need to use an enhanced ECMP hash or that has QPair awareness? I can test congestion control schemes if I'm again focused on the network. Did my tuning, what we talked about earlier, work correctly or have I not tuned my network very well to enable this completion time to run as optimally as possible? So, why, right? We come back to the last piece here. Why still a test tool? And this is based on our lineage, right? Of 20 years being in the networking business and the test business and so on. The number one value we provide is repeatability. Okay? We are a very controlled environment. We control our entire software stack down at nanosecond levels, down to every cycle. We are repeatable, predictable. We provide deeper insights than what you can get with off-the-shelf products. Whether it is a NIC or open source software, we provide far deeper insights. We are easier to manage, there's less equipment. In a lab where power is scarce, we occupy only two use of space compared to the servers that occupy much more. And then there's an aspect that we are easy to learn for people who are new to the domain, for the networking people who are new, this is easier for them to use. So when you're using, um, when customers are using the, 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 the data generator, do they, um, does the tool get information about how the leaves and the spines are configured? Right now we treat it as a black box. But in subsequent things which we're not uh, are talking about today, uh, we'll have more information to gather telemetry. And right, because that would have been my next question, right? If, if you know what your 99th percentile is, you know, you could potentially make recommendations regarding to yes. leaf and... So right now, the network is a black box for us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then just a plug for us. Uh, we're going to be at the OCP in about a month. Uh, please come and visit us.